Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, evil will not win. President Biden bringing that message to the people of Buffalo following the supermarket shooting that killed 10 people in a predominantly black community. The president and the first lady honoring the victims at a memorial right outside the store. In America, evil will not win, I promise you. Hate will not prevail, and white supremacy will not have the last word. Also this morning, we're learning more details about the alleged gunman's plot, the other targets police say he considered before attacking the grocery store. Counting the ballots, this morning we're still awaiting the results of a key Senate primary race that could shake up the balance of power on Capitol Hill. The latest on the Pennsylvania GOP Senate race, with votes too close to call between former President Trump's pick, Dr. Oz, and David McCormick. Plus, we'll break down the other big wins and losses of the night. Surrendering Mariupol, Russian officials say hundreds of Ukrainian fighters have given themselves up in the past 24 hours, essentially putting the besieged city in Russian control. The situation for people still in Mariupol, plus in a big hit to Russia, Sweden and Finland formally apply to join NATO. What this could mean for tensions in the Baltic. And life-changing voice, a former student, is giving back to the debate teacher who inspired him. How he used social media to help the next generation of debate students succeed beyond expectations. So nice when we get to tease one of those really good stories coming yeah, up later. You got to show. raise a lot of money, it looks yeah, like, too. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's good to have you back with us this morning. We start, though, with the latest on that racist attack at a Buffalo supermarket. President Joe Biden met with victims' families Tuesday and blasted the white supremacist ideology behind the shooting. In a strong rebuke, the president called the attack an act of terrorism and called on all of America to reject white supremacy and those who enable it. White supremacy is a poison. We need to say as clearly and forcefully as we can that the ideology of white supremacy has no place in America. None. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett joins us now from Buffalo. Maura, good morning to you. So we know 10 people were killed in Saturday's shooting. President Biden visited with the families of the victims. What did he say to them and how did he pay tribute to those lives lost? Good morning. Yeah, President Biden and Dr. Jill Biden visited the top supermarket and the memorial just off camera to my right yesterday, placing flowers among the growing memorial that we've seen in, in recent days. He then went and spoke with family members and survivors of the shoot shooting, as well as law enforcement who were present, thanking them uh, for what they did to protect the community. But he told them first and foremost that he and Dr. Jill Biden were there to help them grieve. Jill and I bring you this message from deep in our nation's soul. In America, evil will not win, I promise you. Hate will not prevail, and white supremacy will not have the last word. Biden called the attack a murderous racist rampage, and he spoke about the need to get assault weapons off of the streets. Obviously, we've seen a lot of push for gun legislation through Congress in recent years and have gotten nowhere. And so he also noted, though, that uh, he thinks that the, the hate and extremism that we've seen spread online is something that can be controlled and can prevent further, further ra radicalization of other terrorists. And so that's something that he focused on while also providing empathy to the community here. Let's talk more about one point you just brought up, President Biden calling for Congress to act on gun violence. But Buffalo City Council President Pastor Darius Pridgen told us that the community's sadness really has shifted to frustration because the nation just hasn't seen any movement on gun legislation following so many other mass shootings in this country, despite many calls for action. What are you hearing from the community after the president's visit? Well, the mayor here also spoke after meeting with the president, and he said he did see a resolve in the president and what he wanted to get and what he wanted to work in the White House and in Congress to accomplish. But you make a good point there. And so when I was speaking to Pastor Pridgen about what can be done, what this community is looking for in terms of change, he said that there is that shift to frustration and anger, understandably, even as the community is in mourning. And so he told me that while there is, they want to make sure there is change that comes from this, there's that big question mark about what will actually happen. But he did see a positive in this tragedy. I want you to listen to some of our conversation. 
but now people are like, okay, is anything really going to change on a government level? Is the president really going to go back home and work with, you know, Congress uh, to do something for our neighborhood? I think that by this murderer live streaming his actions, putting up online his manifesto, I think that it's really hard for Americans who try to act as if there is no racism anymore in America. And so he's saying point blank, we can't ignore it anymore. It was right there on video for everyone to see. And Pastor Pridgen will be holding several services as funerals start this weekend, Joe. And more a quick question about the suspect. A felony hearing is set for tomorrow. We know he appears to have left that extensive Internet footprint. How is that playing into the investigation? What can we expect from tomorrow's hearing? Right, so tomorrow will be a felony hearing for the suspect, uh, and we're basically going to have a layout because he posted so much online on various different platforms. There is that physical evidence in addition to the video we saw on the live stream, as well as his additional plans uh, that he detailed in his manifesto. And so the DA right now has charged him with one count of murder. We can expect further counts to be brought, obviously, since multiple people uh, were killed in this attack. But that one charge was enough to at least bring him into court, the DA told NBC. Uh, and there they're also saying that they expect to see more brought by the grand jury as well as the federal charges. Now, I do want to quickly add, as we just got a statement from the Broome County DA, that's the county where the shooter went to high school in Binghamton. And you'll probably remember there's been a lot of conversation about, did we know that this could have happened? Because there was a murder-suicide claim by the gunman just last year at his high school. And so the Broome County DA releasing a statement this morning saying he wanted to set the record straight, saying that the school followed protocol and contacted the New York State Police, uh, but that while he made those comments about murder suicide he didn't make any specific threats to a student or the school and he didn't mention any firearms so this is something given his mental health history and and that past claim that's something we can expect to be brought up in court as well but just a little new detail there uh, from the, the the county da just south of here joe maura barrett reporting from buffalo thank you now, experts are questioning what could have been done to stop the shooting, as you were just hearing from Mora. New York has a red flag law intended to get guns out of hands of people who are deemed a risk. But as NBC News correspondent for Investigations Tom Winter tells us, the law was not used when the suspect was investigated less than a year ago. From police to prosecutors to school administrators and to the alleged shooter's family, tough questions are being asked about what more could have been done to prevent 10 black people from being shot dead by an alleged racially motivated killer in Buffalo, New York. Some experts now questioning how the 18-year-old suspect was able to possess a legally purchased assault rifle allegedly used in the killings just less than a year after officials investigated him over threats he allegedly made while in school. In New York, extreme risk protection orders, more commonly referred to as red flag orders, are designed to give law enforcement, schools, and families the power to ask a judge to take someone's guns or prevent them from buying new ones if that person poses a threat to themselves or others. But a state police spokesperson says in this case, nobody asked for such order. I was shocked to learn that the police did not apply for an extreme risk order here. What it says to me is that we need to have more training um, for law enforcement and for others who are able to use this powerful tool um, so that they know in what circumstances it's appropriate, what the processes are. So-called red flag laws are fairly new across the nation. 19 states and the District of Columbia have them, with a majority adopting the law after the 2018 Parkland shooting in Florida. Since New York's red flag law went into effect in August 2019, over 1,400 extreme risk protection orders have been issued, and research shows they help reduce gun violence. Still, this latest shooting, a clear sign that some cases can slip through the cracks. Uh, they interviewed the individual, and they ultimately determined that they were going to bring him in for a mental health evaluation. And it was about a day and a half when uh, the individual was released. This isn't a matter of bringing people into mental health care facilities. This is about whether they are allowed to possess weapons. And it's something that is moved forward with, even if um, it's determined this person doesn't have mental health issues. One development in this case that's not in question a commitment from law enforcement and New York Governor Kathy Hochul to conduct a full review of what happened in the hope of preventing future heartache. It's not entirely clear that this protective order could have stopped this alleged shooter. Possible loopholes, well, these orders aren't permanent, and future gun sales involving background checks 
are the only ones that are affected. All right, Tom Winter, thank you. The November election ballot is taking shape in the key swing state of Pennsylvania, though that high-profile Republican primary for Senate is still too close to call. TV Dr. Mehmet Oz is locked in a neck-and-neck -neck battle with former Wall Street executive David McCormick with 94% of the vote in. The winner is going to face Democrat John Fetterman, who won his primary handily despite a recent health scare. I think every time I'm going to comment on this election music and how it's back. And in the race for Pennsylvania governor, Doug Mastriano, the candidate endorsed by former President Trump, took the Republican victory. He built a following by attempting to overturn the 2020 election results. This fall, he'll be up against Democrat Josh Shapiro, who ran unopposed. Now, one reason this race is particularly something to watch, the winner will appoint the Secretary of State, who will oversee the 2024 election in Pennsylvania, a of course, a critical swing state. We also have results from North Carolina. Republican Ted Budd and Democrat Sherry Beasley will square off this fall for the state's open Senate seat. And that's where we begin with NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray, who yesterday was just as excited as I was about that election music. We've also got Vaughn Hilliard with us. Now, Ted Budd was able to fend off former Governor Pat McCrory, who many know for signing that controversial North Carolina bathroom bill into law back in 2016, something that got national attention. How important was Trump's endorsement? And what does this result say about where the GOP is right now, Mark? Yes, yeah, Savannah, so it was important. But one thing to keep in mind about North Carolina versus some of the other places is that the entire conservative infrastructure was behind Ted Budd. So not only did Donald Trump end up endorsing Budd, but so did the Club for Growth. And as we've seen in a lot of contests, like in last week's Ohio Senate race, sometimes the Club for Growth, a conservative uh, organization, and former President Donald Trump have been on opposite sides. In North Carolina, they were on the same side. But in other contests, Contest, we ended up seeing that Donald Trump's endorsement really didn't work out all that well. And so Madison Cawthorn, the controversial Republican congressman from North Carolina, ended up losing. Also, in Idaho, Donald Trump's endorsement of Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, for, for uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Janice uh, McGeehan ended up losing to incumbent uh, Governor uh, Brad Little. Uh, uh, McGeehan was endorsed by Trump, and so it was a night of mixed endorsement results for the former president. I want to ask you more about something you just brought up. Probably the biggest headline, maybe this morning in North yeah. Carolina, is the 11th district got so much attention because of the annex of first-term Congressman Madison Cawthorn. He's faced scandal after scandal recently. So he lost that deep red district despite being endorsed by Trump. What's the takeaway from that one? Sometimes, Joe, there are just too many scandals, too many controversies that it overwhelms you. What really did stand out to me, the incumbent Senator Tom Tillis ended up endorsing Chuck Edwards, the candidate who ended up defeating Madison Cawthorn. And so a lot of members of the Republican establishment basically moved in to defeat Cawthorn uh, uh, despite Donald Trump's endorsement. And so sometimes, Joe, you know, we ended up seeing the Donald Trump presidency over four years. There were scandal after scandal, a lot of people would say, whatever ended up happening? Well, Donald Trump ended up losing re-election in 2020. And sometimes, like in North Carolina, even with a freshman congressman like Madison Cawthorn, there just become too many scandals and too many controversies. Let's now bring Vaughn in here and get to Pennsylvania, obviously a major state to watch. Vaughn is in Philadelphia. Now that GOP Senate race, as Joe mentioned, is still too close to call, but this is the one with Dr. Oz. So Vaughn, that contest that was shaken up in the final weeks by the surprising rise of a conservative commentator, Kathy Barnett, how much did that particular surge affect the outcome? And, and how is it looking this morning, though, too close to call? Yeah, Savannah and Joe, I think we were up late last night. I think probably we were going to bed right as you guys were getting up here for the show. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a race that we're looking at within, you know, two, 3,000 votes right now is the margin. And there's potentially 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 ballots outstanding. We don't have an exact number of how many ballots need to be counted at this time. But what you see in these results is Mehmet Oz, the celebrity TV doctor, and David McCormick, the former hedge fund CEO, you know, within a margin that is ultimately probably going to lead to a recount here. Mm -hmm. But you asked about Kathy Barnett. She's the conservative commentator here who is, despite not having the Trump endorsement, was running as a MAGA candidate, in her own words there, essentially suggesting that it didn't take Donald Trump's acknowledgement to be the most uh, so-called America first candidate. And she made inroads. She isn't going to win 
this nomination here. At the same time, she diluted of, of the votes of both of these individuals. And I was talking to uh, Barnett's advisor, who told me that they believe that they had an impact, particularly on Mehmet Oz. When you so look at some of these counties around the greater Philadelphia area here, where Oz was expecting to perform better, that would suggest that that is the case. If he doesn't pull it off, we may be calling Barnett a spoiler. Mon, you look great for so little sleep. So yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question about the governor's race there. It's going to be one of the most watched matchups this fall. Uh, help us understand this campaign that Doug Mastriano has run so far. And, and is it going to work in a general election this November? Or is he going to have to change the message? I mean, that is the question here that not only Pennsylvania voters are going to be looking at, but also potentially voters in the likes of Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan. I name those states here because they have leading Republican candidates that really kind of echo the Doug Mastriano message. What is that message? The 2020 election was rigged. These governors in each of these states, they are tasked with certifying the election results in uh, their elections. And so if Doug Mastriano were to become the governor of Pennsylvania, he'd be in charge of certifying the results of the 2024 presidential election here. And that is where potentially we are looking at electoral chaos in the situation that, you know, let's say a Donald Trump, uh, if he were to run again uh, and lose, and he would not validate Joe Biden or another Democrat's victory here, we are talking about a very complicated moment for our democracy here. Mm. And I think that is where the question will come down to Pennsylvania voters here. He will be facing the current Democratic Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, who had no challenger in the Democratic primary here for governor. It's going to be quite the race over these next five months. Wow. I'd say the 2024 election starts right now. Yeah. Bon and Mark, thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And now from our earthly politics to UFOs, for the first time in more than half a century, Congress held a public hearing to discuss them. They're officially called unidentified aerial phenomena, and there have been plenty of reported sightings out there. So where do we go from here? NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz has the latest. New video of a UFO shown to lawmakers in Congress raising more questions and answers. I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific uh, uh, object is. The footage recorded from a fighter pilot cell phone capturing a few frames of a metallic object. UAPs are unexplained, it's true, but they are real. They need to be investigated, and many threats they pose need to be mitigated. Pentagon officials using the video during a congressional hearing as an illustration of how hard it is to determine what the objects actually are. Last year, the Pentagon releasing a report looking into more than 140 cases of what they called unidentified aerial phenomena. The Pentagon officials said at least 18 cases included sensor data showing the objects behaving in ways they could not explain, but also releasing video of other cases they say are likely man-made drones appearing to swarm Navy ships during a series of incidents that involved an object seen dropping into the water. What was splashed? splashed. Do we have any sensors underwater uh, to um, detect on submerged UAPs? So I think uh, that would be more appropriately addressed in closed session, sir. Intelligence committee members then briefed behind closed doors while other members of Congress expressed frustration over a lack of answers. I, I do not fear the American public knowing what we have. I would sure as heck like them to see it. Our thanks to Gotti Schwartz for that report. Joining us now to dive further into all of this phenomena is Greg E. Gigian. He is a professor of history at Penn State University. Good morning, Professor. Thanks so much for joining us. So this hearing we were just talking about, were you surprised by anything that came out of it? What stood out to you? Well, you know, in many ways, not a lot. I thought we went over a lot of territory we've been over before. And we got to remember what this was really about. I mean, what, what it was was back in December, the National Defense Authorization Act had said, said that by the end of June, an office needs to be set up that is relatively permanent and dedicated to the study of these unidentified flying objects or UAP. Um, and so the, 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 the subcommittee was really just mostly interested in saying, where are we? Are we getting there? Are we at this point? So a lot of what we heard really in the session was a lot of stuff we've kind of heard before. Um, maybe what was new was to hear that a director of that program has now been named, though the person was not public 
publicly named. Um, and we've heard that that uh, the, the folks who are looking into this in intelligence are setting up a whole set of really uh, rigorous protocols for collecting data, storing the data, analyzing the data, and try to get behind this. But beyond that, we didn't get a lot of answers. So, Professor, I mean, you were featured in a Showtime docuseries about UFOs. You've acknowledged that many discussions around this topic are, are rooted in conspiracy theories. Here you are, a legitimate expert who focuses on the science. How do you deal with conspiracy theories? And what's your advice to the rest of us who are learning about this topic and really want, like you, the most accurate information? Well, you know, of course, I look at conspiracy theories as part of really the whole social and political uh, culture surrounding this phenomenon, surrounding a whole bunch of different phenomena for that matter. Um, it's, it's something that is so enmeshed and entangled in the UFO question. It started already in the in just the earliest years of the so-called flying saucer sightings in the 1940s. Um, and it's something that's there and it's always going to, I think, be there and be part of it. But I think as you're hinting at, what it does, and in fact, um, uh, uh, both officials yesterday uh, flagged this and said, what it does is it clouds the subject up. It makes it a little difficult to know what's reliable and what's not reliable. And what I would have to say is that, unfortunately, it's a very, very difficult thing to be able to disentangle what are reputable, reliable sources of information and what might be less reputable. And that's one of the things you have to sort of uh, manage through yourself. Quickly on this last one, which isn't terribly fair considering the topic, but uh, where do you stand in terms of the presence of UFOs? Is there life out there? <laughs> <laughs> well, no one knows for sure, right? I consider myself an open-minded, skeptical agnostic is the way I put it. Um, we don't have anything definitive at this point in time, nothing that's convinced a whole ra wide range of independent investigators. So we're still waiting for answers. All right, Professor, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We do appreciate it. All right, time to get a check on your morning news now. Weather? Which means Michelle Grossman joins us in studio. Hi, Michelle. Good morning, you guys. And we are looking at a summer sizzler. It feels like summer, at least, mm. and it's still spring. We have that jet stream so far to the north. It's kind of keeping that cool Canadian air up to the north and allowing that warm air coming in. So more records challenged today. We've had 11 straight days of 90s and 100s in the state of Texas. And we're going to do it again today. So San Antonio, 100 degrees. That is 13 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Dallas, you're close to 102, 98, 98 today, Laredo 104, 92 in Little Rock, and 93 in Jackson. And then as we go throughout tomorrow, this heat, the 90s are going to spread to the east. So we're 10, 20 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Charlotte, 94 tomorrow, that's 15 degrees above average for this time of year. And Savannah, you are at 95. Not you, Savannah, this is Savannah. You're at 10. <laughs> <laughs> by the weekend, we're looking at temperatures in the 80s for Pittsburgh Friday and Saturday and 71 by Sunday. So we are going to cool down as we head towards the weekend. Weekend. So as we go throughout today, also, we're looking at those May storms, right? It's severe weather season, so we're seeing a cold front after cold front after cold front. That will be the story today. That's your trigger mechanism along with that warm air in place. So as we go throughout today, we're seeing that cold front swinging into the Ohio Valley. Late day storms with that second cold front developing across the Midwest. And we could see some hail, some gusty winds, also some flooding rains with these storms. Then tomorrow, here's another cold front right on the heels. New severe threat for Minnesota, Iowa, also Wisconsin. Heavy rain possible with some flooding, even up to three inches in some spots. We've had so much rain there, guys. We're going to continue to watch that. And then the bullseye for the storms this afternoon will be in parts of Kentucky. Mm. All right. Wow. Heat across the country. Yeah. I kind of like, like it. summer. Me and, too. And you're a 10 too. Yeah. So. We're so, <laughs> so smart. 10s all around. 10s so all around. All in our Wednesday pink. Yeah. Especially, those, for that. especially in those pants the other day. Yeah. Oh, 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 those, yes. That's yes. Oh, Joe's red carpet those look. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrity. Google it right. if, you, if you don't know what we're talking about. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for in a bit. Yeah. And coming up, a historic moment in Europe as Sweden and Finland formally apply to join NATO. Russia previously warned those countries against joining the alliance. So what could this mean for the war in Ukraine? That's next. You're watching Morning News Network.
This morning, Russia's defense ministry says more Ukrainian fighters who had been trapped inside that besieged steel plant in Mariupol have surrendered. Moscow says nearly 1,000 soldiers have given themselves up since Monday, with almost 700 surrendering in the last 24 hours. Now, Ukrainian authorities have not yet commented on that. It comes amid mounting uncertainty over the fate of the first group of fighters who were evacuated on Monday and taken to Russian-held territory. Meanwhile, Finland and Sweden have officially submitted applications to join NATO today. Speaking to reporters, NATO's secretary general said their membership request was, quote, warmly welcomed. You are our closest partners, and your membership in NATO would increase our shared security. The applications you have made today are an historic step. Allies will now consider the next steps on their path to NATO. The security interests of all allies have to be taken into account. And we are determined to work through all issues and reach rapid conclusions. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from Lviv. So, Jay, I want to start with what we were talking about at that steel plant, actually. So there's a lot of uncertainty over what's going to happen yeah. to all these Ukrainian fighters. What do we know about what's going on and why are some in Russia opposed specifically to a prisoner exchange, which is essentially what Ukraine is putting forward? Yes, yeah, Savannah, a lot of conflicting messages coming out of the Kremlin. Let's start with remembering that this was a relatively small group of Ukraine fighters that held off the Russian army for nearly three months in what's described as one of the longest and bloodiest battles in Europe's history. Now, Vladimir Putin has personally said that he will make sure these prisoners are treated humanely and that the process goes as has been discussed. But there are several politicians in Moscow now saying that, first of all, they don't think there should be a prisoner exchange, calling this group of fighters Nazis, and some saying they should be executed. It, it's a big concern for a lot of people here in Ukraine who consider this group heroes for what they've done and are anxious to see them get back home. Oh, absolutely. Now, let's move away from Mariupol, and it does seem yeah. like there is some better news for Ukraine in certain places, especially near its second largest city, Kharkiv. Tell us the latest on Russia's offensive in the east yeah. in that Donbass region. You know what? Fr frankly, uh, when you talk to intelligence officials, including those in the U.S., there is not much progress. The Ukraine fighters have done an excellent job of pushing those battalions back almost to the Russian border, in some cases possibly past the border there. Uh, what we're hearing is, is, and what we're seeing, is that the shelling continues. Uh, they're really pummeling the region from both the sea with missiles and from the air with bombs. Uh, but the ground games have been minimal at best. It, it, it's a it's a real strong point for the Ukraine army and one that they're desperately trying to keep hold of. Mm. Jay, also today we'll see the start of Ukraine's first war crimes trial. It's of a Russian soldier accused of killing an unarmed civilian. And this comes after the U.S. actually announced a new program to document Russian war crimes. It's called Conflict Observatory. What are the aims of that program and what does that mean the role of the U.S. will be here? It's kind of interesting. The State Department put a $6 million initial investment into all of this. It'll get support from other European partners. But they're basically cataloging and maintaining an evidence chain of things like satellite imagery, uh, posts on social media, pictures, anything that may be a potential war crime, and making sure that it's valid for use in court as Ukraine goes forward in prosecuting these crimes. It's an important step, and one that the U.S. believes will help to, again, show their support uh, of the Ukraine fighters and what's happening here in this country. Jay Gray, we always are grateful for your reporting. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. Uh, thank you. Let's bring in Jamil Jaffer. He's the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute and the former associate White House counsel to President George W. Bush. Good to have you with us, Jamil. So let's start off in Mariupol. That long battle there appears to be all but over following the surrenders at the steel plant. And this could be Russia's real first major victory in this war. Help us understand how significant is this moment? Could it boost Russia's attack in the Donbass region? 
Well, you know, I think one of the challenges here, Joe, is that it does give the Russians now a swath of Ukrainian territory uh, from their border down to Crimea. They've also taken control of Kherson and installed a uh, a Russian-friendly government there. Uh, so we, it is it is a you know a problematic situation. Largely, the fight for Mariupol has been has been over, but for this uh, one group of uh, fighters that were holed up um, in that Azovstal steel plant. Uh, the one thing that to be said, though, that's important to note here um, is that the loss of this port city now gives Russia access to the sea there, um, and that is a challenge. They're still trying to get the port in Odessa, um, and so Russia will continue to try to expand its efforts. The one thing it does also show for Russia is that st sticking it out, right, and engaging these siege tactics can be successful in the long run for them. Let's talk NATO. This morning we saw Finland and Sweden officially submit those applications to join despite objections from a NATO member, Turkey. Russia's foreign minister appeared to downplay these historically neutral countries joining the alliance. He said it makes no difference. And he also said NATO has been using their territory for military drills for years. So two questions for you here. First, do you think NATO can overcome Turkey's opposition? And second, do you think this could have any impact at all on the war in Ukraine? Well, I think there's uh, two things to be said about that. One is I think NATO has to overcome Turkey's objections. The idea that Turkey, you know, under a fairly authoritarian government uh, with President Erdogan uh, could stand in the way of uh, the accession of two very important nations, uh, Finland and Sweden, Finland with an 800 mile border uh, with Russia uh, would be problematic. Uh, you know, Turkey is already engaged in significant, uh, you know, uh, odd behavior for a NATO ally. They bought Russian S-400 missiles a few years back. Um, and they uh, their concerns, as they express them, are about the uh, support that Finland and Sweden have uh, provided for uh, a Kurdish opposition group within Turkey. Of course, the problem is, is that is that Turkey uh, has had this problem with all the NATO allies, many of whom have supported the Kurds and their independence movement, not in Turkey, but outside of Turkey. And so, look, this is a long-term fight for Turkey to fight, but the, NATO will overcome those objections. Uh, the accession of Finland and Sweden is a huge change, notwithstanding the Russians' uh, claims that it's not. Uh, and so this is a big move here for NATO. And Jamil, quickly, I want to get your take on the state of peace talks right now. We know both Russia and Ukraine blame each other for the breakdown in negotiations. Can anything be done right now to get them back to the table? Well, the Russians have got to be willing to give up some amount of territory that they've already taken. The Ukrainians have now put their foot down saying, look, you know, we've we've pushed you back in a number of places. So the question is, how much territory do the Russians keep at the end of this negotiation? And what is Ukraine willing to agree to? That's, I think, the fundamental challenge here. With Ukraine succeeding, right, they have every incentive to keep the ball going on the negotiations. The Russians have won in Mariupol. So right now, not a lot of incentive for either side to come to the table and really find a middle ground. Jamil Jaffer, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks. Now, coming up, COVID cases are rising nationwide, and a lot of people are getting reinfected. So how many times can you get the virus? Well, we're going to bring that question to a doctor next, including the impact that COVID can have on people in the long term. Plus, the benefits of working out. We know it can help our heart and our mental health, but turns out it can help improve our bones, too. The disease exercise can prevent. That's up next. Welcome back. The FDA has authorized Pfizer's COVID booster shot for kids 5 to 11 years old, bringing relief to millions of parents ready to boost their kids, while other parents have hesitated to get their kids their first doses. The CDC is expected to meet tomorrow to decide whether it will be giving its recommendation for the booster. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky will have the final say. Dr. Bob Lahita joins us now for more on this. He's the director of the Institute for Autoimmune and Rheumatic Diseases at St. Joseph Health and a professor of medicine at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. Dr. Lahita, I feel like our viewers could probably recite those titles at this point because you're such a friend of the show. It's great to see you. So the FDA commissioner says more kids have been getting sick and hospitalized with the virus, specifically since the Omicron variant was first detected. But we also do know that vaccination rates among this age group are relatively low. So what do parents need to know about getting their kids a shot in the first place? But particularly, what should they consider when getting a third shot for kids in that 5 to 11 range? Well, the first thing, Savannah, is to make sure they get the kids vaccinated. There are 8 million of the 28 million eligible 5 to 11 age group that have been vaccinated, that have gotten two shots. Now, the FDA is saying they're eligible now for a booster shot about five months after their second injection. Mm -hmm. Now, two Pfizer doses decrease infectivity in this group by 31% in that 5 to 11 age group, and in the in 58% decrease infection in the 12 to the 15 uh, age group. So it's essential that children 
get vaccinated. Now, you know, the interesting thing about this is that kids get infected and we don't know about it. Uh, only those who are admitted to the hospital in most of these infections we hear about. And the kids that get, in, in, uh, get admitted to the hospital are extremely ill. And that is very, very important to understand. Yes. So it's critical. Yeah. Okay, great, doctor. Thank you. Now, New York City's COVID alert has changed from medium to high, and that's particularly because hospitalization rates have jumped 28% in the last week. We know cases had been going up, but that had been remaining relatively low. How can New Yorkers get back to a lower community spread? Where do you see this heading for us? Will the warmer weather help bring this down? Well, I don't think the warmer weather is going to bring this down. We thought that about a year ago. We right. thought that this virus might be seasonal, but it's not seasonal. There are about 130 new admissions in New York City per day now. So it's possible that this may strain the health care system. That's why it's up to orange. Mask mandates have not been made yet by the mayor. However, we are orange. That means we're at high risk. And it means that in grocery stores, in offices, and in public indoor settings, you should use common sense and wear a mask, certainly on subways, buses, taxis, Ubers, et cetera, as well. Good advice there. Now, doctor, I want to ask you about something we teased about. Health officials in New York have warned reinfections are possible, especially with the Omicron variant now. I am somebody who has had quite a few positive tests since this has started. How often can someone be infected with COVID? What kind of impact does reinfection have on the body? And does this just keep happening after a few months once your immunity sort of wears off? Well, it seems, Savannah, that the Omicron variant is immune evasive. Now, that's very interesting because, remember, the cousin to the Omicron is the common cold, the cause of the common cold. So you can get infected many times per month. You can be infected three or four times a month, just as you would when you had the common cold in the old days. All even more important to wash your hands and possibly wear a mask to prevent reinfection. We only hear about those who are very sick, so we expect right. that the numbers of these Omicron variant infected people are much higher than we hear about. And that is troubling news. I think this is going to be with us forever, and I fear the appearance of a new variant uh, sort of like the Delta variant that can wreak havoc and cause severe mm. disease. Yeah, absolutely. And you're so right about how you don't hear about people who are not ending up at the hospital. Um, and a lot of people are just mild or asymptomatic in those reinfections. Dr. Bob Lahida, thank you so much. Always good to see you. Time for our weekly checkup. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us to discuss some of the latest health headlines you might have missed. Dr. Patel, good to have you with us. So let's start with the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association. They release new guidelines when it comes to handling a bleeding stroke. Remind us, what kind of stroke yeah. is that? And then what do these new guidelines tell us? Yeah, Joe, so about 800,000 individuals suffer from a stroke each year, and 10% of those, a significant number, are what we call bleeding strokes. So these are technically bleeding within the brain. They can often be fatal, and they can often leave, like other strokes, people with serious symptoms. So what we understand and know is growing, and it's interesting. We see that certain treatments that we thought were really effective in these types of strokes, anti-seizure medications, antidepressant medications, unless someone has seizures or depression, are not as effective. And then some other things that I was doing traditionally in these patients, such as compression stockings, those really tight stockings to prevent deep vein clots are also not as effective. But here's the takeaway, the doctor's orders, if you will. We really want to try to emphasize recognizing signs and symptoms of stroke. And the other thing that came out of this study is that really people who take care of family members and caregivers around people who have these types of strokes really need training. It's not that easy to just discharge someone from a hospital or a rehab center and learn how to take care of patients. Mm. So go seek these resources out and understand modifying lifestyle, cigarette smoking, weight, all those things can help in prevention of secondary strokes after you have one. Important reminder there on how to stay healthy. Now, Dr. Patel, our next study might be something parents are interested in. It shows that about 60% of preschool age children in the country attend some type of childcare, but that they might not be getting as much physical activity as they need at these daycare centers. What can you tell us and what do parents need to know? Yeah, so national recommendations, my children are in this category, recommend that you get some sort of physical activity at least twice a week 
for a total of about 60 to 90 minutes. Now, you would just think, oh, it's beautiful weather, that's a natural and it's a given. But as you point out, this study really looked into whether physical activity was literally happening. And this means not just walking desk to chair, but also getting out and getting some moderate impact. And so here are kind of our takeaway doctor's orders for this one. Number one, be a role model. Because look, when my kids come mm. home, if they see me doing something active, if I take them with me on walks, Modeling that behavior reinforces that behavior. And then number two, talk to your child care provider. We're all so stressed and strapped for time right now. But even just a brief email or a conversation to just say, I really want to know if you're helping our children get moving. That can emphasize mm. this very important recommendation. Some good <laughs> advice there. Yeah. All right. I also want to ask you about osteoporosis. We know it can cause weaker bones, especially in mm -hmm. older women, but that doesn't mean people with the condition should avoid exercise. In fact, a new study shows quite the opposite for yeah. them. So what are experts recommending? Yeah, I, this is one of my favorite topics because, first of all, over about 10 million men and women have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, which is really just, it's one of the leading bone diseases in our world, but it also is a weakening of the bones that can lead to a risk of fractures. But a lot of people have misinterpreted it, that if they do heavy exercise, that's lifting weights, or even things like Zumba or like jogging, that they could increase their chances of fractures. The study puts that to rest, that is not true. So the takeaway orders, number one, lift weights, don't be afraid men and women because men do get osteoporosis and if you're going for it have good form lift those weights don't don't be scared it can actually help your bone cartilage and then number two making sure that you understand that osteoporosis just increasing activity light activity even jogging zumba will not increase your risk of fractures and can be protective and it's a good thing and if you can do it while you're modeling that in front of a daycare child that's around, <laughs> there you all go. the better. Two Zumba birds with, two birds with one stone. In the parking lot of the exactly. preschool. Yeah. I like that. Doctor's <laughs> orders. <laughs> Zumba. Yeah, all right. at least Zumba's yeah. fun. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. It. Now, later this summer, the first black woman will be sworn into the nation's highest court. Coming up here, we're taking a look back at the pioneers who paved the way for judges like Katanji Brown Jackson. The story behind the first black woman to become a lawyer in Texas. That's next. Welcome back. Wall Street's recent roller coaster appears to be pulling back into the station, at least for now. Yeah, Silvana Hanau joins us with what's hopefully a little bit of a deep breath for some people and more financial headlines to start your morning. Hey, Silvana. Hey guys, good morning. Well, it does look like Wall Street could take a step back after yesterday's solid rally. That's all the Dow rise 431 points, while the S&P gained 2%, and the Nasdaq was up nearly 3%. Stocks have been pressured by inflation and the Federal Reserve's attempt to tamp down rising prices with rate hikes, which has fueled concerns about a possible recession. In focus today, a report on housing starts and earnings from Target and Lowe's. The nation's biggest flight attendants union is throwing its support behind Frontier Airlines' bid to buy rival Spirit Airlines. The Association of Flight Attendants represents crews at both airlines. It says it has a deal that will protect members from furloughs during the merger process. JetBlue announced a hostile takeover offer for Spirit earlier this week. Flight attendants at JetBlue are represented by a different union. Walmart will host a one weekend only event exclusively for Walmart Plus members from June 2nd through the 5th. The retail giant says members liked getting early access on Black Friday, so it was inspired to create this new weekend event. Walmart Plus members will have access to the deepest discounts on thousands of hot summer items, such as a Shark vacuum and a Samsung Galaxy S7. Walmart Plus costs $98 a year, and customers who sign up during this special weekend will get a $20 promo code off their next online purchase, guys. Mm. All right, Silvana, thanks so much. Appreciate it. You got Thank it. you. Now, Ketanji Brown Jackson will make history this summer when she is sworn in as the first black female Supreme Court justice. As we near that milestone, we're taking a look back and remembering those who have paved the way. That includes Charlie Ferris, who shattered the glass ceiling by becoming the first black female lawyer ever in Texas. NBC News Now's correspondent Priscilla Thompson has her story. Perseverant, relentless, door opener. Those words used to describe the legacy of Charlie Ferris, the first black woman to become a lawyer in Texas. Charlie grew up in Wichita Falls, Texas, and attended the segregated Booker T. Washington High School. After graduating as valedictorian at age 15, she enrolled at Prairie View A&M University. The local school here, Midwestern University at that time, was not an option. It was segregated. 
In 1947, Charlie graduated college at the age of 18 with a degree in political science. She spent a year teaching before starting law school at the University of Denver. She then transferred to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where her class worked on the landmark Brown v. Board of Education case. Thurgood Marshall practiced his Supreme Court arguments in front of her class. She graduated from Howard in 1953, passed the bar exam, and was sworn in on November 12th, becoming the first black woman lawyer in Texas. There were no parties. Uh, there was no celebration. It was like, Charlie, you have done what was expected of you. And uh, that's the way Charlie approached it as well. She was extremely selfless. Just a few months later, in July 1954, Charlie Ferris was unanimously elected to serve as county judge pro tem in Wichita County, Texas, becoming one of the first black judges in the South since Reconstruction. Our local newspaper at the time would not publish, would not print pictures of blacks. But that discrimination continued inside, where there were segregated bathrooms and drinking fountains. The courthouse didn't desegregate until 1962, years after Charlie left the building. Charlie's family and friends say she never allowed the discrimination and challenges to make her bitter. She worked within the system. She took it on, and she was not going to let those things that she knew were wrong stop her from her practice and representing her clients. In 1955, Charlie opened her own law practice. She was the only uh, black attorney in Wichita Falls area. Her legacy lives on in Texas today, where Charlie has been featured in a traveling exhibition as part of the Legends Project, created by the Wichita Falls Alliance for Arts and Culture. The town is also raising money to create a statue in her honor. Officials say they hope it will be in place by 2023. Ms. Ferris actually opened an office in our downtown area where she'd previously not been able to do so. Her office was there for decades, staring right at the courthouse front steps. Uh, and that's where we'd like to honor her with our sculpture, with a, with a monument to her, to her legacy. But that legacy extends far beyond Texas. I think Vice President Harris and, and Judge Jackson, who's now undergoing the, the, the process, I think they would be the first to tell you that it was attorneys like Charlie Harris whose shoulders they stand on today. In 2006, Charlie was appointed to serve on the Board of Regents at Midwestern State University, a school she was barred from attending decades earlier. She continued to serve on the Board of Regents until 2010, the same year she died. She was very selfless. She opened so many doors for so many people, people that she met, but she opened doors and inspired people that she never met. And I think that's really her greatest legacy. Mm. Inspired people for sure. Pretty incredible story. Our thanks to Priscilla Thompson for that. Coming up, finding their voice. Yeah, New York man is sharing his story to help the debate coach who changed his life, the major way the online community rallied behind them. That's up next. A Japanese city is paying young people to move into housing complexes where elderly residents live. Chiba City, which is just outside Tokyo, announced that it will pay newlyweds under the age of 39 up to 300,000 yen, that's about $2,300, to huh. move in. Vice reports that LGBTQ couples can also apply despite the country's ban on gay marriage. The program is part of an effort to bring young people back to the city, which has been nicknamed Japan's ghost town. Japan has the oldest citizens in the world, and its population has been shrinking hmm. since the 70s. Kind of reminds me of the stories we've done here in America where um, uh, they put daycares and schools inside senior citizen facilities yeah, and the yeah. kids and the seniors interact, which yeah. I always love. Oh, I know. It's so sweet to see. But, hey, that's a pretty good idea. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Take All it. right. Cool. <laughs> Maybe it'll work. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Now, a former New York City high school student is sharing his story of perseverance and finding his voice thanks to his high school debate coach. As NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas explains that story is now helping that teacher's life as well. New York City High School debate coach K.M. Landria has a simple argument. There's no such thing as tough kids. It's kids who are going through something tough. Deco Landria, who goes by Deco, has spent more than a decade teaching high school speech and debate in the city. 
One of those kids who was going through something tough was Jonathan Conyers. At the age of 14, he joined Deco's debate club after a run-in with law enforcement. He went on to compete and debate at Ivy League tournaments and earned a college scholarship, attributing his success to Deco's persistence and encouragement. I want to be people's Deco. I want to continue to give back to my community. Deco has continued to be a leader in New York City's public school speech and debate community, starting the Brooklyn Debate League as a way to fight inequity in schools. And I didn't think it was fair that folks that already had the financial means and probably were going to the fancier schools we're getting this heads up in middle school. But going up against the wealthier schools takes money, and Deco was financing the league with thousands of his own savings. We were broke. I, I had poured money into this. <laughs> we were under broke. <laughs> so that's when Jonathan reached out to the popular Instagram page, Humans of New York, sharing the personal details of his story with the page's millions of followers. It was the biggest way I think I can really dedicate this to Deco. Brandon Stanton, the photographer behind Humans of New York, started a GoFundMe for Deco. Deco's debate league. The people of New York and around the world have stepped up and shown their love. In just one week, that fundraiser exceeding its goal, raising $1.3 million for Deco and the Brooklyn Debate League. The league plans to use the funds to expand into public schools around the city. The sky's the limit. Like, let's go. Like, let's do all the things we wanted to do. Two humans of New York finding their voices through debate, now hoping to level the playing field for the next generation. Oh, I always love those stories that come out of humans of New York. So cool to see. Very Especially cool. since we live here. Good you humans. Know, you're like, yeah, good humans. exactly. Very good humans. And our thanks, of course, to Tommy Thomas for that. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.